Getting engaged is a moment worth cherishing. A one-of-a-kind ring that you design at Blue Nile can help your love sparkle. Just choose your diamond and setting. When you've found the one, you'll get it delivered right to your door. Finding the right engagement ring can be nerve-wracking. At Blue Nile, you'll have the expert guidance needed and a diamond guarantee that ensures you're getting the highest quality at the best price. Cherish all of life's moments and save up to 30% at BlueNile.com. That's BlueNile.com. With threats to our nation waiting around every corner, adaptability is more important than ever. When conditions change without notice, quick strategic thinking is crucial. And with obstacles consistently impending, determination is essential in overcoming them. It's this willingness, decisiveness, and resilience that sets Marines apart. With our fighting spirit, we don't just fight battles, we win them. Marines are the constant our nation counts on to fight the unknown. And through adaptable problem solving, we do just that. Learn more at Marines.com. Hey guys, it is Ryan. I'm not sure if you know this about me, but I'm a bit of a fun fanatic when I can. I like to work, but I like fun too. It's a thing. And now the truth is out there. I can tell you about my favorite place to have fun. Chumba Casino. They have hundreds of social casino style games to choose from with new games released each week. You can play for free anytime, anywhere And each day brings a new chance to collect daily bonuses. So join me in the fun. Sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. VTW. Void or prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus. This is Anything But Footy, your Olympic podcast, talking all things Olympic, Paralympic sport. And following last week's retirement special, we've got more big retirement news in the world of sport. Seven days ago, we were discussing John Jackson, Jazz Carlin, and James DeGale. We've got more coming up for you as well. Plus, we'll be talking race walking. We'll be talking karate. Adam Peaty will get a mention on the show, and we'd love to hear from you as well. On Twitter, at Anything But F. On Facebook, on Instagram, on YouTube. And you can email us always as well, anythingbutfooty at gmail.com. This is Michael. And I'm John. And if you do like us, please share the podcast as well. Download it. Like it on iTunes because it really helps in our in our popularity rating if you can do that. And we love to cover sport, Michael, don't we, for being sport, for being the best and celebrating that. It's not about being nasty to each other or reveling in people's demise or, frankly, running onto a pitch and trying to hit someone. This is all about loving sport, loving the passion, the determination, the skill needed to be the best of the very best. But a question to kick us off with, Michael, when is retirement not retirement? Uh, maybe it's when Mo Farah says, I'm going to retire from the track. Yeah, Mo Farah, of course, went out on a huge high at London 2017 with a couple of medals. Wasn't quite the, the double golds that we'd hoped for, but then turned his attention to, you know, that proper retirement kind of pursuit. <laughs> marathon running Just now i've done one marathon <laughs> one marathon and and at the end of it um i i was interviewed actually at the end of it and i think i swore which is probably why i never made the tv edit uh, but i said never again i meant never again mo farah on the road and when you talk about you know people invading pitches and the like in the sporting week that we've just witnessed how wonderful is it to see thirteen thousand people taking part in the big half in london one by mo farah Great time as well, 61 minutes, 14 seconds. A mention for David Weir in the wheelchair event as well. And one of my favourite sporting events of the year, the London Marathon, is just around the corner. Mo Farah, of course, still funded by British Athletics. Is he going to have a tilt at the marathon in Doha and win another World Championship gold medal? Could we see him back on top of an Olympic podium in 2020 as well? Mm, And what he said before the race and after the race is, and he said he was watching the European Indoor Championships, of course, we saw Lura Muir do the double-double, and we talked about that on Anything But Footy, uh, episode three, of course. And as you rightly said, Michael, he did the double-double at the Olympics, winning London 2012 on the track, the 5 and 10K, and then doing it in Rio as well. And what he said is that he might return to the track in Doha and try and go for the 10K because what he's saying is basically it hasn't improved, that people are, are running at a level where he thinks he could compete. And what he actually says is you get the atmosphere and he, what he said, he, he watched that and he missed running in front of a home crowd. He said, you get it at the London Marathon. And he says, but I do miss the track. I do miss representing my country. And I suppose what I'd like to put maybe to Mo, if we got the chance, Michael, to speak to him, is yes, in the UK, and that's why we do our Anything But Footy podcast, is we want to big up the events in the UK, because as we say, we put on the best 
uh, sporting events in in the world, I think, because we have the crowds that do it. And you saw it in Glasgow and you'll see it at the London half, as you said, this weekend. And then also the London Marathon at the end of April. But it's not going to be the same in Doha, is it? It's not going to be like running at London 2017, where he won that 10K and couldn't quite do another, you know, um, triple double, if you like, with the 5K. That that, that atmosphere, uh, however Doha put on this event, it's not going to be the same, is it? Yeah, and it's a shame, really, because British Athletics does get some criticism because they don't necessarily fill the grandstands at events like the British Championships. But when the major events, the big ones, come, like the World Championships, when the Olympic Games, of course, were here, we saw morning sessions where there weren't really many medals up for grabs. And I know the IAAF have worked now to, to try and even out that sort of spread of medals. So if you do get tickets for a morning session, you do hopefully see a medal event. But 60,000 people still coming and watching you know, morning events events at world championships and that is for me the one thing that keeps me interested in track and field in athletics it was the sport I was most interested in growing up it's the sport I've lost quite a bit of trust in over the past few years but then when I go to these events and I go to the anniversary games and I see 60,000 people still coming out buying tickets Mm. wanting to come and cheer their heroes on it just makes me fall in love with it all over again I can see why Mo Farah I can understand what he's saying. I can see why he's saying that because, you know, you're a long time retired. That's the old adage, isn't it, as a sportsman, unless you're, you know, a crown green bowler, in which case he can go to the Gold Coast and win Commonwealth Games medals at 60, 70. But Mo Farah will be a long, long time retired. So, you know, while he still thinks he can be competitive, while he still thinks that he can win medals and while he still thinks he can make money out of it, then why not? So do you think he should? Well, I think, as he says, if it hasn't improved in terms of the quality, then why not? Why not come back if he thinks he can win another 10,000 metres gold medal on the track? As I said, I think I would like to see him concentrate on the marathon. It's yeah. a very different discipline. He's he's not mastered it yet. He's not mastered, you know, running as part of those big city marathons in terms of, you know, getting the fluids on board, getting the energy on board, uh, stopping or, or not stopping, as the case is, at the drink stations and things. You know, he said he wanted to turn his attention to, to marathon running. There's a lot of money. There's a lot of prestige in being a, a big city marathon runner as well, if you're doing it as he is at the very highest level. I would like to see him, and I think it would really cement his place in the sport, if he could go away, finish his career, whatever age, whatever time of life that is, and say, I won it in the 5,000 metres and the 10,000 metres on the track, and then I went to World Championships and possibly another Olympic Games and did it in the marathon as well. That, for me, would put him right, right up there with the very, very, very best. And I know we're not supposed to agree on everything, but I, I really do think you're right that he should. He said after 2017 that I'm going to concentrate on the marathon and this is what I want to do. And he went to London afterwards and, and finished third, which was a great performance. And then, of course, he won his first marathon and set a new European record of two hours, five minutes, 11 seconds in Chicago in October. And then... It you know, even at the London half uh, at the weekend, you know, he was t- he said he got stomach cramp during the race, but he managed to pull through. Uh, he felt it was a good run out. I mean, it was incredibly windy, so it wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't the easiest race. As you said, 61 minutes, 14 seconds and, and holding off his training partner, Bashir Abdi of Belgium. It was a it was a good performance. But until, as you say, he's winning marathons and then maybe then goes to Tokyo and wins the Olympic marathon. And then maybe go back to the track, because I just think if he doesn't, because he tried to do the marathon before and it didn't work and he came back on the track uh, and focused on that. It feels like it's unfinished business for me if he doesn't do the marathon. And talking of unfinished business, I mean, he he said that afterwards that uh, he, he felt pretty good ahead of the London Marathon at the end of April, uh, which he says is still a long way off. Now, I tell you what, Michael, if you're training for the marathon at the moment, you do not think the London Marathon is that far, is that far away. Uh, it's very, very close. Good luck to everybody uh, who's running, uh, as Michael said. And just a quick word on the London half. What a, you know, it's the second time this has taken place. Moe's won it twice, but they're trying to get London's diverse community running. 
because you know sometimes running can be seen as a as a very kind of one dimensional sport it's about a community running festival for everyone no matter their age background or running ability and it was uh, great to see mo winning it for a second time and well done to charlotte perdue last year's champion she won again ahead of steph twell in a time of 70 minutes and 38 seconds and as you rightly say david weir uh, warming up for his 20th london marathon with victory in the elite women's wheelchair race yeah, congratulations to Mo Farah. Still obviously a huge favourite with the British sporting public. And if, if the big half has given you maybe just a thought that you'd like to get involved, see something similar, and the London Marathon in April is probably just beyond you. You've not got a place for that one. Don't forget the London Landmarks Half Marathon is taking place on the 24th of March, which is another big sporting occasion coming to the capital city. So we're talking retirements mm. on anything but footy, and we're actually going to talk about people that we think are properly retiring. That said... They are both going into other jobs in their sport. And I think we should give a mention, firstly, to cyclist Callum Skinner, the Glasgow-born 26-year-old, which seems quite early to be stepping down from his sport. A gold medalist, of course, with Philip Hines and Jason Kenny in Rio. A silver medal behind Jason Kenny in the final of the sprint. He's won European and Commonwealth medals as well. Callum Skinner has announced he's uh, stepping down from professional cycling this week. And John Schofield, who's won a medal at London 2012, a bronze in the K2 200 and a silver in the K2 200 in 2016. That is an event that's not going to be in the 2020 Olympics, which is probably behind the decision that John Schofield has made. But let's talk about Callum Skinner, first of all, because he obviously made quite a big splash in recent weeks as the lead athlete in this this new organisation, this new initiative called Global Athletes, which is aiming to set out to support and protect the interests of sports people. And he has announced his retirement in a statement, and he will now be working to concentrate on being an advocate for sports people's rights and conditions. And I guess, you know, it would be remiss of us not to mention a bit of the backstory. Lots of sports in this country and abroad have had alleged bullying. The culture has been questioned over recent weeks. British cycling, we all know it as a medal factory, but at what cost? So maybe it's important that someone like Callum Skinner, who's been in the medal factory, is now taken on board to try and protect other athletes potentially going through the kind of experiences he had. And, you know, when I talk about that, I go back to 2012. He discovered a lump in his neck. It meant that he missed the 2012 Olympics. It wasn't cancerous, fortunately. He took some time out from the sport. But I guess, John, that puts things into perspective for him. Yeah, I think it does. And you're absolutely right that, um, you know, at the age of 26, it seems weird to be talking about someone retiring. But, I, you know, he got a bronze at the Gold Coast uh, Commonwealth Games for Scotland uh, last year, of course. And, and you were there, Michael, and, and watching that. And you mentioned that, you know, that gold and silver that we we witnessed him in Rio in, in the sprint team. Um, and, and maybe he just felt that he didn't want to go through it again. You know, you, you, you know when you're in, oh, <laughs> to, to, to coin a phrase, uh, not a cliche, when you're on the cycle of uh, the Olympics, it just it's, it's the same thing week in, week out, month after month and year after year. And some people love it to bits. So Steve Redgrave uh, was on that rowing cycle uh, for a very long time and couldn't get off. And as you say, Mo Farah, we were talking about him a minute ago, you know, he, he obviously doesn't feel like he wants to get off uh, um, that, that particular ride. But Callum wants to do something different. I think you're right. This new organisation to push for enhanced rights for athletes. And it really shows that athletes want to start taking control of their own fate and not relying on bureaucrats and administrators, uh, I think is the, is the key phrase uh, that global athletes kind of want to look at. And I thought maybe we could bring a, a, in a slightly different topic while we talk about Callum uh, retiring and him going to do something else with British Cycling and this new global athletes. Because, you know, you mentioned Adam Peaty. You know, he is now uh, one of our greatest Olympians. And he desperately, desperately wants the world of swimming to become a sport where he can make money because he should be making money because he's a sportsman, but also to be in the modern era and to be, you know, p what people are talking about. And he's, de he's you know, announced that he's going to lead this new London-based franchise in the new International Swimming League, 
which I'm assuming is very similar uh, to like the snooker Premier League that they brought in because snooker was seen as just one thing every year, the World Championships, and they wanted to reach out to different people. Um, and, and swimming needs to do the same thing, uh, and particularly targeting people who've been um, cheating for drugs and found guilty of, of, of drug cheating. They will never be allowed to compete. It's all done by this financial backer and the ISL owner, uh, Konstantin Grigorshin. And, you know, he's investing more than 17 million pounds in this new venture. And it just shows the work, the sporting governing body for swimming. Um, you know, the Hungarian three time Olympic champion Katrina Hozu uh, in 2017 uh, called FINA, the uh, sporting, uh, the swimming governing body as chaos and possessed with leaders with no vision. And you just think that maybe it's about time that sports that don't quite, you know, hit the headlines that we talk about every week, that they, you know, someone has to take control. And maybe Callum Skinner, by doing what he's doing, uh, and maybe Adam Peaty, while still competing, can try and get these sports into the new, you know, 21st century. And Adam Peaty is a great example. We were talking recently on Anything But Footy in a previous episode about the, the, the vacuum, the power vacuum in the top of, of British sport. And we were discussing who might take on those roles. And, you know, Adam Peaty is putting himself up there, isn't he, to be, if you like, the swimming Seb Co. Because he has taken on FINA. They've had to backtrack because they were talking about a potential ban for those taking part in this new initiative. And they have now launched their own swim series. But Adam Peaty has described that as too little, too late. So he is the front man and he is the main man and he is the biggest swimmer in the world at the moment. He's going to lead this London-based franchise. It launches in October. It's going to come to London on the 23rd, 24th of November. There will be eight franchises, six events. There will be a finals in Las Vegas in December as well. So I think it's an exciting time for swimming. And I think you have to give credit to someone like Adam Peaty, who could probably go to the next Olympics, win another bunch of medals, and then probably retire from his sport. But he's thinking bigger picture. Mm. Personally, I'm sure he's thinking bigger picture that he needs to make, you know, to uh, to borrow a, a phrase, a bigger splash <laughs> in his sport. And I think also he needs to think, how do I make swimming relevant? How do I make swimming relevant 52 weeks of the year, like the Champions League or the, the Premier League or, you know, even, you know, the county championship in cricket, the premiership in rugby. How do I make swimming one of those sports that people will, will talk about and follow and follow the stars and follow the events week in, week out? This is an initiative to try and do that. And I, I, and I, I, t- we, I tell you what, I mean, he, he will know more about it than, than we will. But the fact that FINA... Um, ultimately managed to push through uh, two events for the Tokyo 2020 uh, through to the new swimming program. The 800 metre men's and the women's 1500 metres events are now going to be at Tokyo 2020. Now, no disrespect to those those events, but actually watching someone going up and down, up and down a swimming pool is not necessarily the most exciting thing. Well, actually, more races, sprint races, you know, you just got to need a balance of them, don't you? You know, they do have the long races. We saw that with Rebecca Randington winning gold medals uh, in in, in Beijing with the long distance races but but it's it feels like you know cricket has gone to 2020 and that's the thing that people can, can get get into the cricket but swimming seems to in you know from an Olympic point of view has added two of the longest races um in, in its entirety it seems bizarre yeah and it's interesting isn't it because you look at the minute there are lots of discussions in lots of sports around programs and disciplines what's going to be in the Olympics break dancing is set for inclusion, of course, as we've already discussed in 2024. It's huge. It's the second biggest participation sport in France. So you can see why Paris wanted in. And then you look at something like karate, which is going to be one of the highlights, I think, of Tokyo 2020. But then it gets dropped for Paris 2024. So if you're UK sport, I've got some sympathy with them and their funding programs. They've got a limited pot of money. Lottery funding is declining because less people are, play- are playing playing the lottery. Mm. And their role, UK sport, is to deliver medal moments. They've also got claims then for sports like basketball, who have mass participation programs. How are they putting together some kind of long-term structured program to win medals in karate? When it's in in 2020, then it's out in 2024. And we talked about John Schofield, the canoeist who's retiring as well this week, to take on a role as head of performance and pathways at British Canoeing. His event is dropped. He's been concentrating on the single kayak clearly it's not happening for him 
His K2 event has gone for 2020, so he has to step out, if you like, from elite performance. And, you know, I think British canoeing is an interesting example at the moment as a governing body that has got a world championships coming to this country later on in the year. And for the first time ever, they've got tickets to sell. They've got a lot of tickets to sell as well. And that is a new thing for British canoeing, and it's a new challenge for them. And I think at the minute, governing bodies with different disciplines, things dropping in and out, the Olympic program changing, there are a lot of challenges for sporting governing bodies out there. There is, and absolutely, to, to mention John, as you said, you know, he won with Liam Heath, uh, the bronze and silver uh, at London uh, 2012 and Rio uh, in 2016 after they they formed their partnership in 2009 after missing out uh, in Beijing and yeah and then you know the event gets removed from the from the Tokyo Olympic Games and that must be a, a, a tough thing you know John Schofield won 24 international men's K2 200 meter medals at every level and that is a highly successful career but good on him for actually going well no what I want to do is try as you say bring on the next generation the head of performance at Scottish canoeing uh, he'll pick that up from june and we wish him all the best you can contact us on email we'd always love your thoughts on all our debates anything but footy at gmail.com we're also on social media anything but f on twitter we're on facebook we're on youtube uh, we're on instagram and we might even get around to snapchat at some point as well <laughs> and talking about yeah. That's still a thing. Uh, we've got a MySpace page. No, we haven't. Um, talking about different disciplines, race walking has been in the news. It's a rather curious discipline, race walking, but I quite enjoy watching it. And I think in this country, we, we've got a great guy, Tom Bosworth, who you know is a world record holder at the mile in race walking. He's a multi-British record holder. He's he's got a great personality as well in terms of didn't promoting his sport. He celebrates proposed. well. He proposed at Rio, didn't he? He did, and he lied to me because um, I went to meet him at the Olympic Village because he did fantastically well in Rio. He led for so, so long, but just dropped out of the medals. I, fin- I think he finished sixth in the end, something like that. And I went to see him at the Olympic Village, and I went, well, what, what happens now, Tom? He went, oh, I'll just quiet a few days now, just rest up, recuperate. Within an hour, I'm seeing a picture on his social media feed so that he's on, he's on one knee and proposing to, to I think, his now husband. So, <laughs> Every time I see him, every time I see him, I remind him about that lie as well. <laughs> He's not happy, though, at the moment because um, they're changing the distances or they're mm. talking about changing the distances, the IAAF, um, because at the minute you have a kind of 20 kilometre race walk. You have a 50 kilometre race walk. They have announced three significant changes. They are going to have equal events for men and women at the Olympics in the future because we didn't have a 50 kilometre women's race. There will be an electronic chip insole. Uh, the technology will be coming in from 2021. That's basically looking at how much you lift your foot off the ground because if you watch race walking, you'll see the stewards, the judges, if you like, coming up with these these little discs. And if you get too many of them, you get kicked out. Famously, I think in Sydney, there was an Australian, wasn't there? And she That's was right. leading into the Olympic Stadium and, and she was kicked out and she burst into tears. She was just thinking she was going to have one lap of the track and she was going to be a gold medalist in in her home Olympics, and it didn't happen for her. So I think that's probably a good thing. We're seeing technology increasingly in sport, of course. But they're changing the distances from 10 kilometres to 30 kilometres. And this goes back to a point we spoke about earlier on. The consultation happened with federations, with athletes, with event organisers, and other stakeholders, in brackets, broadcasters. (laughs) So they want to make it more exciting for television. Yeah, exactly right. And that and that's the thing. You, you you want the heritage of these events. And, you know, race walking, I mean, to be honest, Michael, I never thought I'd be having a conversation about race walking in my life. But, you know, it's been in the Olympics since the day that it started. And it is one of those events where actually every four years, as you rightly say, you know, Tom Bosworth did an amazing job and represents great British athletics so brilliantly in, the, in that event. And, and actually, he may benefit from the shorten of this, but he doesn't want it because he wants to, you know, know be the 50 kilometer champion that's what it's that's what it's all about so uh, you, you need the heritage of it but you also need to be able to attract people to it but look you know also times get quicker and I uh, you know I think even you know in in the last few days uh, Liu Hong who I know you're a big fan of uh, of China she's become the first ever woman to walk under the four hour barrier in the 50 kilometer race walk and she was the Rio gold medalist she knocked off five minutes from the previous record uh, that was broken last year. So it, it, it does seem a bit strange that you want to then reduce these, these lengths down. But, you know, this is, 
as you say, the modern world, people want things immediately. They want to look at it on their phone. They want to know the result. They want to know uh, whether, you know, th uh, the race has been won uh, by the right person. They don't, you know, want to find out in 11 years, uh, 11 years hence that someone was a drugs cheat and they've got kicked out. And it's the same with, with you know, you don't want to sit there waiting for, for, you know, two hours for a race to end. You actually just want to, to, to get on with it. So it, it's a bit, we're, we're kind of caught up in this whole modern world phenomenon, aren't we, really? Yeah, swimming, obviously, are embracing it, as we mentioned, with the, the new event. They obviously need to create something that's packaged for telly. They tried the duel in the pool, of course, which was a kind of Ryder Cup-style event. Clearly, when we've mentioned breakdancing, that is going to be good TV at the Olympics in 2024. Rugby Sevens was a fantastic success in Rio. They decided, obviously, with the with rugby coming into the games, that they weren't going to play the 15 a side game. They were going to play Sevens because it's lots of quick games. It's exciting. It's end-to-end, -end, and that's how it proved. And then, obviously, here with race walking, they are looking to, you know, for want of a better phrase, sex it up a bit. And I think this is the way they think they can do it. Now, what Tom Bosworth said, which I think was quite interesting, was he said, I kind of understand if we were changing the distances to, say, a marathon distance, if we were doing a marathon race walk, because the general public know what a marathon is. Yeah. They get a marathon. 30 kilometres, 10 kilometres, do you really know? 10 kilometres is what, six and a half miles? Yeah, about that. Something like that. Yeah. So I understand what he's saying there. We're just sort of changing it for the sake of change. If we're going to change the distance, let's go for something that, that people understand and people get. Talking of change, the IAAF are having these meetings in uh, in Doha at the moment ahead of the World Championships. And uh, they've also just announced that you will be able to qualify for the Tokyo Olympics by being uh, part of your new or their new world rankings um, position. They announced a couple of weeks ago that they were going to have these new world rankings for athletics. So you can officially say that you're world number one um, in, say, the 10,000 metres um, or the 100 metres or whatever, uh, rather than having to be the reigning world champion. You can be the current world number one. So what they've announced is that you can either qualify, as you always have to have do, by setting t uh, times and targets, um, which then the uh, the, uh, the the team, so Team GB would select you on that, but also you can qualify for the uh, by the world rankings. And they, they hope, Michael, they've said to, tonight uh, that they say they've designed to achieve about 50% of the target numbers for each event through entry standards and the remaining 50% through the IAAF world ranking system. So things are changing in sport and maybe we need to uh, embrace them. In other Olympic sports news this week, congratulations to Nia Evans. If you were listening last week, you'll know I sat on her feet. If you don't know the uh, <laughs> go back and listen the story, to it. go back and listen. If you don't to know it. the story behind that story, you have to go back to last week's. Well done to her. She won the six-day cycling event in Hong Kong, and we've had more medals at the diving as well this week. Yeah, we have uh, Jack Law, of course, uh, his third bronze in two World Series events in Asia. Uh, this time at the Water Cube, the famous Water Cube in Beijing. Um, he managed to uh, grab um, his three-metre synchro bronze, improved overall by 10 points. And then Tom Daly and Grace Reed also picked up uh, mixed three-metre synchro bronze as well. So uh, a reasonably good performance for the British divers. They have a bit of a break now into April, so Tom is coming back uh, to uh, to look after the baby and catch up with Lance, I'm sure, as well. But also, just interesting, Michael, very quickly, more mixed events in the Olympics. I mean, wouldn't it be great to have these these mixed diving events in the Olympics? Again, the diving always seems to be very much well here's the men's 10 meters and here's the women's three meters and 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 not having the mixed events which obviously the world diving series which is coming to london in may if you want to see it by the way um you know that we have more events of like that in the olympics that would make it more appealing surely mixed um swimming obviously is coming in and i've watched quite a bit of the the mixed swimming at the various aquatic championships commonwealth games as well it is exciting it's enjoyable we've had mixed triathlon of course um which is coming to the olympic games as well and talking triathlon congratulations to alex ye second in his first world triathlon series event uh, been taking place in abu dhabi and jess learmont who uh, i think is probably the next one off the rank if you like to succeed non stanford and vicky holland as a potential future world champion she was on the podium as well uh, she finished 
third. Yi trains in Leeds at the Brownlee Centre. Remember, the World Series comes to Leeds in June. So many sporting events. Before we finish, uh, one other line for you. A potential bid to host the 2026 Commonwealth Games has moved a step closer. For which city? Well, it would be Adelaide. The South Australian government announcing they'll conduct a feasibility study. My question is, does that mean really the UK and Australia are the only nations big enough to stage the Commonwealth Games? Because, of course, we've just had it at the Gold Coast. And to come, we have it in Birmingham in 2022. Is it going to go back to Australia in 2026? It depends, I guess, on whether the finances are there for other cities. You would think Canada would still have the capability if they wanted to. And that's the big question. If they wanted to, Canada would still have the capability. I think the Commonwealth Games Federation was scared by how bad Delhi went and how it nearly completely didn't happen. Um, I'd like to see maybe Singapore, somewhere like that, uh, after Kuala Lumpur yeah. in '98, looked a bid perhaps. But yes, increasingly it looks like the Commonwealth Games Maybe we'll just bounce between the UK and Australia with the occasional bid maybe from South Africa. But look what happened to Durban there. The occasional bid from Canada and who knows where else. You can always get in touch with us. Plenty of ways to get in touch with us during the week, John. Absolutely, you can. It is at anything but F on Twitter. It is anything but footy at gmail.com. We're on Facebook, we're on Insta. And please, if you like us, share us, download us, like us on iTunes, please. Sports Social Podcast Network. Lucky Land Casino asking people what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car before my kids' PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details.